So, if you can just imagine that this is the year 1815, and that we're not in Chatham, and we're not in Fort Amherst, that we're in Belgium, and it's a few days after the Battle of Waterloo, and this chap here, Deakin, has presented himself three days after the battle, lost a lot of blood, the bleeding has now stopped, but he's got a compound fracture of the tibia and fibula of the lower leg, badly smashed. Now he tells us that he's been hit by a French round shot, which is patent nonsense, because if a round shot hits you, um, it's called avulsion. It takes the limb straight off, and uh, ligaments, uh, muscles, fatty tissue, skin, everything goes. The bone is usually taken out of the socket. And this all happens in a second. Arteries are pulled and then snap. And if you imagine the neck of a wine bottle, the shape of the artery that's left effectively closes off. So an avulsion, a complete removal of the limb, means no bleeding. He'll be in shock but not in pain. He would have been better off if his leg had been taken off by a round shot because now we're going to have to take it off and it's going to be agony for him because it's days after the first initial trauma shock. I've had a look at his leg, it's turned black, it's smelling of cheese, it's necrotic, so it's dyed. It will have to come off. Now, because this chap is part of the first foot guards and we're a family regiment, we don't want him going back to some general hospital in Antwerp or Ostend, mixing with a lot of line soldiers and getting what knows disease. We want him to stay with us. Now, we're under orders to march to Paris in a few days' time. It's the first time the British Army has been to Paris since Agincourt. So Napoleon has now gone. The French have had enough of fighting. Um, but he wants to follow us on to Paris. And he will. He'll have a place still in the regiment as a clerk or working in the, in the hospital. We're going to endeavour to take his leg off below the knee. Now, if you feel your own leg, you've got the tibia and fibula very close to the surface there. What I'm going to endeavour to do is to, to cut off before the gangrene has reached his knee. And I'm going to cut off enough for the knee to be articulated back 90 degrees so that he can then, within five days, put a wooden leg on. He, it'll be no more painful for him than kneeling on a pile of books. His knee will be in that wooden leg and he'll follow us on. If I take it up further off, I can do a fancy cut. I can use tucks and flaps and rather like book binding, I can make a nice looking stump with the flesh pulling over, uh, the skin, etc. And it'll be a wound that will definitely heal, but it will take longer. And it'll be more painful for him to put a wooden leg on, which has got a cut fitted over there. So we're going to try and keep his kneecap, the knee joint, but we're just going to cut through those two bones there. And we've got to do it. So I'd like to introduce people. We've got... Um, Deakin, young Deakin here, who's the chap who's been wounded. We've got the colour sergeant here who's going to help restrain him. We've got the quartermaster who's in charge of this tourniquet, which is a petted screw tourniquet. And we've got um, a couple of guys here just holding on to the legs uh, and looking after him. Now, that tourniquet, the petted screw tourniquet, has got a little thing called a compressor or pad, which actually crushes up the main femoral artery against the femur leg and it will shut off all blood flow completely to the rest of his leg. Now, we just put the sand down here to stop the bit of blood in case I slip on it because we're going to be moving around. Um, when I cut through, it's going to be called a guillotine cut and it's going to be straight round in one move. In other words, it's chopped completely off and then I have to saw. We've got a leather retractor which will then go on over the bone and the quartermaster will come round here and pull up the leather retractor, which pulls all the muscles up. So when I cut through the bone, it's close to the leather. When he lets it go, the muscles will then expand and the bone will disappear inside. And it's got a nice clean little stomach for him. And then I'll have to find and locate the arteries to sort of tie them off well. I'll just show you how I'm going to cut through. Um, this sort of, this sort of knife here, amputation knife, slightly curved. And what I'll do is, if that's his leg, I've actually got to push up through here and cut it this way. I'm using the whole length of the blade, 
cutting around and I've got to feel for the bone. It's got to scrape that bone and I mustn't leave it. It's got to go in one sweep right the way round and I've got to finish where I started. The fancy cut that I mentioned up here, I'd go in two sweeps. One to go through the skin and soft tissues. I would then fold that up a few inches and then go through the muscles, which would leave a little overlap. But this one is called the guillotine cut. It's quite dangerous, but um, it's quick and it'll be over quickly. Now the other thing is, um, these operations have to be done quickly um, because of the patient might be in some sort of pain. I'm just looking around for my... Oh, boy, I don't want to get splashed. Um, they're quite quickly, and has anyone got a, a watch they could actually time this? I want you to time this operation from the moment of the first cut to the moment the leg's taken away, and then the second part will be just patching them up and tying them off. So if you could, can you see, it's rather gloomy in here, but if you can see it the time, that would be very, very useful. I mean, normally all this conversation wouldn't take place in front of the, uh, the patient. If you're going to torture someone, you show them the instruments first, which is what we're doing to this poor lad here. Normally, it would just happen, and he wouldn't know what really was hitting him. Uh, it's going to be very, very stressful, and he's going to be in pain, and he's going to be screaming. And in here is Neat Gin, which is Holland Gin, and it's very, very good for calming nerves. Okay? <laughs> we don't give him any because he's had enough already. I mean, the story behind this chap is that last, well, just before the battle, the night before the battle, he was asleep under a hedge with his right-hand man with a blanket over them, um, drunk, and he missed Rivali, he missed the dressing bugle, he missed the call to arms. And then he managed... He was run over by a gun wheel from British artillery. So the first casualty of the first foot guards, who has lost his foot, was run over by a British gun wheel. And he was so ashamed of it, he managed to limp up to the battlefield with his mate, and the two of them fought the full day at Waterloo, and he remained three days on the field, laying under a tree, just drinking out of a puddle. He was too scared or ashamed to rejoin the regiment. So he gave his place up on the wagon to someone who was more wounded. So he's more scared of the lash and flogging, really, than the, the, the French, the enemy. So his injury was caused by a British gun wheel. But in years' time, he's going to be in an ingle nook of some pub somewhere with his Waterloo medal, telling everyone how a French cannonball uh, took his leg off. But that's not the case. He's lost a lot of blood, so he's quite weak. And, um, what I'm anxious about is when we actually tighten up that tourniquet is that there won't be enough blood pressure to then back op open the artery because the inside walls of the artery are quite sort of sticky at this point and they'll join together. So the, the quartermaster's got to tighten it up real tight and we just hope it's going to open up again. Right, have you got your watches ready? If you please, gentlemen. Tight as you can, please, call your master. Tight as you can.
and just slacken that off two oh. turns. Oh. Now the reason oh. he's doing this, just one, two, oh. is so that I can find where that main artery is, the femoral artery, and I'm going to hook that out with a thing called a tenaculum, and I've got a silk ligature around here just to tie it off. A little bit more, please. disarticulation of the hip, where they'll actually make a cut here and expose enough Passed bone down. to be able to <laughs> hold, gone. and then dislocated the hip and did a lot of tucks and flats. So that was taking the hip joint completely out, and again on the, uh, the upper arm here they could actually uh, take the shoulder out, including the scapula and a clavicle, all completely gone. And they did all this without anaesthetic um, and without any... Uh, uh, antisepsis or anything like that. But we've saved his life, he's lost his leg, he won't be dancing again. We're all off tonight to a dance, aren't we, in Brussels? <laughs> oh, <laughs> we are. Ladies of Brussels have invited us to a dance, but poor Deacon won't be going, which is a shame. But he will stay, stay with us as part of the regiment, and he will probably be ending up um, either as a clerk or working in the hospital with his wooden leg, which is seen as a badge of honour. The, the troops actually wanted their leg taken away because they knew that once wet gangrene got into the system, that was it, they had it. Okay, thank you for being attentive and enjoy the rest of your tour. I hope that hasn't put you off your lunch.